Welcome to the Good Friday service here at Escon Village. Hey, I just want to let you know that we're going to be in Mark uh, chapter 14, beginning in verse 32 uh, through 42. And what we're going to be looking at is, is Jesus's time in the Garden of Gethsemane and his uh, intimate relationship uh, with his Father, our Father, because of him, uh, um, and, and asking this question uh, concerning the will of, of Jesus versus the will of God. All right, we're going to understand that a little more. So I'm going to read in uh, Mark 14, 32 through 42. Then they came to a place which was named uh, Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, uh, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little further and he fell to the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping. And he said, Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know how to answer him. Then he came a third time and said to him, said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. You know, and we see this picture of Jesus and he takes his friends with him and he wanted, he wanted them to help him to watch because he knew that danger was coming and he wanted them to watch and pray for him while he was in there talking to the Father and he collapsed on the ground and he began to, uh, he began to pray and he really only prayed one thing. Uh, can this cup or what you have called me to do, not, not can what you called me to do be, be moved, removed, but how it's going to be accomplished be changed? If, can this hour change? And, uh, you know, when, when Brenda and I went to uh, Jerusalem this past year, I'm telling you, I, I, I mean, we loved it. It changed our life everywhere. The Wailing Wall, everywhere we went was, was powerful. The upper room, everywhere. Uh, but, but the Garden of Gethsemane truly touched me, spiritually speaking. Uh, not, not so much the, the, uh, the church, the church was beautiful, but the garden itself, I just sensed in my spirit a peace. I sensed in my spirit that this was a place, uh, I know that Jesus went here often, but this was the place, a place, where you could meet with God and pray and, and, and just really feel this intimacy with, with God in the Holy Spirit. In fact, uh, when I read in verse 36 with what we just read, it, it's, he said, Abba, Father, and that speaks of an intimacy. He said, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You know, and, and he, he was, this was just an honest, intimate prayer with him. And I found that, you know, in, in living my life for the last, I don't know, nearly 30 years uh, for Jesus and, and uh, having a call on my life, um, there are times where, the, you know, you know you received the word of the Lord. You, you know that it was God speaking to you at the moment. But as time goes by and as, as pressure comes and as you don't see things in the natural happening that you believe were supposed to happen in the time that you thought they were going to happen, uh, you begin to start needing to talk to God. Is there a different way to do this? Uh, can, I, can you give me confirmation that what I'm doing is, is what I was supposed to be doing? Uh, it, did I hear you right in the first place? And that's why I always write, write these things down. I write down when God speaks to me. I write down what he says. I write down the scripture that he re is referring to. And, and I write down my thoughts and, and everything. That way, when time passes, and time does pass, oftentimes years, you can go back to that, and it will encourage you to continue on 
and uh, and do what God calls you to do because oftentimes what he say is I, I, I meant it then and I mean it now nothing's changed uh, just because you don't see it we don't walk by sight we walk by the spirit and we walk by faith and so I always you know I have to pray and remind myself of that and I'm sure Jesus here's Jesus he's in the garden he knows this in this hour that that his betrayer is coming and he's asking his father he's not asking his father to change what he need what needs to be done he came to save the lost he's not asking to change that his will is that he doesn't have to go through the cross to do that and and so I I, I was thinking about that and and I thought how does God answer Jesus well Jesus was just like us a human being I, I know he was God who be, who the word who became flesh I know that but on this earth he walked by in the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Lord and he had scriptures of the Old Testament to lean on and these scriptures often spoke of him they prophesied about him and one such scripture was in Isaiah 50 verses 5 and 7 5 through 7 and verse 5 says this the Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Now this is this is about to, this is about Jesus in Isaiah. And what what verse five says is, I heard the word of the Father, and I listened to it, I submitted to it, I wasn't rebellious to it, and I didn't walk away from it. In fact, I walked in it. Verse six. Therefore, this is this is about Jesus. Therefore, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from the shame and spitting. This is what's about to happen in him. And I, I can't help but not think that Isaiah came to his, to his mind, to his spirit. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint and I know that I will not be ashamed. If this verse had been used uh, by the Holy Spirit to really um, uh, build Jesus up in this time of need, to remind him of his call, and, and that he is to submit to the cup that's before him, uh, I can't help but think that that's not what, because the word brings comfort, right? And I know that Jesus knew that the will of the Father was through the cross. And this word from Isaiah would have strengthened him and would have set his resolve to endure through the struggle. The struggle. The struggle not about what's going through, that's part of it, but really in the garden the struggle is between wills. My will versus God will, God's will. Jesus' will as a human versus God's will. For redemption of humanity there is a relationship between the patience was one has during the struggle and character a lot of people would say this a lot of people would say that struggle builds character it's not true because there are people who have struggled and they don't come out with better character stronger character I'll tell you what struggle does is it reveals character and whatever character you had going into it, it will either, it will build that type of character. So if you have a strong character, a character of patience and perseverance, as you go into the struggle, then when you come out, your patience or perseverance will become stronger. And it will lead to a, a hope that God has uh, built into you and this hope will not be disappointing. But if you come into it and you're, uh, uh, you're not patient and and you 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 sense that you're not able to overcome this trouble then that will re reveal itself and it will it will then build upon that and you will not be stronger the next time it will prove that you uh, are not able to go through it and so we want to make sure that that what the struggle does it's not the builder it's the revealer as we look at this and not only that look at uh, Romans 5 verses 3 and 4 it says this and not only that but we also glory in tribulation. Remember the glory that we talked about, talked about this last week. The glory for here is that we boast in God. So, so here it is. And not only that, but we also brag about God in tribulation or boast in our relationship with God 
and tribulation, knowing that this tribulation and trouble produces perseverance, this type, talking about this, in, while you're boasting in God, you're going to become more patient and you're going to become persevering, and that persevering will build a character like God, and this character will build a hope. Amen. Praise God. And Jesus showed great patience before and during his journey to the cross. Amen. Jesus' time in the Garden of Gethsemane was a time where, as a human being, he was asking his Father if this was truly the only way to redeem humanity from sin and the curse that sin brings. Jesus, Jesus was not seeking to escape his responsibility. He was struggling with the horrendous pressure of the situation any human would rather avoid. Praying to God for direction, praying to God for confirmation of his will during these times of struggle is not cowardice, nor is it rebellion against God, nor is it being double-minded. It truly is an honest and true emotional experience as we live our lives according to God's will and not according to our own. We must suffer the flesh. What does that mean? We must resist temptation. We must resist giving to, into our own will. Not give into our way of thinking about how things ought to be done simply because we think God's way is too hard. You know, Jesus spoke in the verse, uh, in verse 38, he was talking to uh, uh, Peter, James, and John. And he said, watch and pray. He said, be vigilant, pay attention, and pray, lest you enter into temptation, lest you enter into this battle with the will. Listen, that's what temptation is. It's your will versus God's will. And he's saying, don't give in to this temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. You have a spirit in you. It's indeed willing. But this flesh is weak. And so the battle with the mind, the battle with the will, the battle with the intellect, the desires, happens between the spirit and the flesh and the mind. The soul gets to decide what to do. So watch and pray. Guard yourself against giving in to the weakness of the flesh. So what is the temptation? to accomplish God's will our own way and not in God's way. You know, this, we, in, in, in seeing this, we can see in Isaiah 55, chapter 55, verses 6 through 9, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So we need to seek God. Seek God first and his way of doing things. There's the priority. And let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So if we're not in God's way, if we're not doing things the way God thinks we ought to, or the way God has told us to do things, then we are doing things in our own wicked way. Because God says in verse uh, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. There is not a better way than God's way. I'm going to say that again. There is not a better way than God's way. And I always have to tell myself, quit looking for the easy way. It's, it doesn't matter whether it's easy or hard. What matters is, is it God's will or my will? Is it God's way or my, my way? And I want God's way. Each of us, each of us that have heard the will and the plan of God for our own lives have come to a place where we ask the Father, because all things are possible to you, is there another way of doing this? 
And if God's answer is, this is the only way, then I must again die to self and surrender to his way. Surrender to God's way. Listen, self-preservation of our own will struggles with the surrendering to God's perfect will. Just as Jesus entered the garden to have an honest conversation with the Father, so must we enter into an intimate and honest conversation or prayer with our Heavenly Father. In the garden, we confirm God's redemptive call on our lives. We become resolved. Like it says in Isaiah 50, I set my face like flint. As Jesus was resolved, to drink the cup that the Father has given us. Jesus was destined to die for our sins, and we are destined to live for Christ and his righteousness. The Father redeemed us through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross in order that we may live out a life of redemption we become an instrument of redemption by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at verse, uh, verse 36. And he said, again, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You know, I see two things in this struggle of wills. I see intimacy and willingness. The intimacy between the Son of God and his heavenly father and the and the trust that Jesus has in the father to willingly surrender to his will the intimacy of relationship is found in Jesus's opening statement opening words of this prayer it's abba father you know when we're when we pray Jesus talked about this in Matthew we're to say our father who is in heaven our Father who is in heaven. That's how we open our prayer. That there's an intimacy with that. He's our Father. We're his children. And these words describe the Son's trust in his heavenly Father. If there were another way, wouldn't, wouldn't you think that the heavenly Father would have sent uh, 10,000 angels to rescue his Son from this very moment? If there were another way. Sometimes when we find ourselves... Uh, following God's plan, listening to God's will in our lives, and it seems hard or it seems like nothing's happening, don't you know that if God had a different way for us to do it, he would tell us, he would rescue us from the moment that we're in. But there was no other way. Jesus had to go to the cross. When the only way out is through, you are still, are you still able to call God, Abba, Father. Or are we offended? Your character, my character, will provide the answer to that question. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will, should be, is not a, a sign of resignation. Jesus wasn't going, okay, God, okay, Father, whatever. Okay, I resign to your will. No, that's not what this is. These are words of intimate trust and a willing commitment. Not my will. I want your will in my life. That's what this is saying. It's not resignation. It's commitment. It's trust. There are times in our lives when everything argues for another way, another course. But deep in the integrity of our own hearts, we know that another way isn't the Father's way. The living Jesus, notice I said living Jesus, who has come to forgive us and save us, comes to live in us, to give us the same strength of character that he has. Because Jesus chose to go to the cross, redemption came to the world. Let's look at John 3, 16 through 18, uh, powerful words. Uh, get your Bibles and look at it with me. John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe in him is condemned already. Listen, I hear it all the time. How can you worship a God that sends people to hell? How can you, how can you, uh, how can you adore him? How can you follow him? How can you believe he's a good God? I tell you, God has never sent any human being to hell. Because of our rebellion in the first garden, in the Garden of Eden, because of humanity's rebellion, sin came into this world, the curse came into it, and death came into it. And we were condemned from that moment on. But when Jesus came, he came not to condemn us because we were already condemned. We didn't need to be condemned. We were already condemned. What we needed was a Savior. And Jesus came to be the Savior. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only Son. That if we will believe on him, that we shall not perish. He didn't, con he didn't come to condemn us. We were already condemned. We need salvation. We need, we need Jesus. Because Jesus chose the Father's will, full redemption and salvation became available to all who would receive it. Okay. To all who would receive it. And then three days later, the resurrection of power of God into our lives crushed all the power of hell and opened the gates of glory to the redeemed. Hey, if you're the redeemed, say so. I am the redeemed. Jesus Christ redeemed me. The Father sent the Son to die for my sins, that he who knew no sin could become sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that I, you, might become the righteousness of God. And that's what happened on the cross. That's what happened. That was, that's what needed to happen when, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's saying, is there another way? The answer was no. Son, I'm sorry, no other way. If there were, I would have had another way. This is it, the only way. Let us imagine the impact that our submission has when we submit to His way. That our submission has an impact on other people that don't know him. Listen, we're not their savior, but we are the instrument of God's saving grace. When we bring our struggles to the cross in obedience, it shows that we have submitted to the call and the will of God. We experience the glorious power of his resurrection and his blessing in ourselves and we also experience it flowing through and beyond us praise god you know as i as i close as i conclude this this message i pray that each of us live out the redemption that jesus made available to us that those who do not know him that those who do not know jesus will receive the same gift of salvation. Praise God.